I'm Pastor Josh. And I'm Pastor Tara. We want to welcome you to our YouTube page and we pray that today you are blessed by everything you experience. And if you are blessed by this sermon, please don't forget to share it with someone in your world. Let's go live to the message. We began a series together as a church on Psalm 91. And today we are going to continue looking into that because this is such a powerful, relevant uh, revelation for such a time as this. And I just want to say that as you gather in church, uh, church is awesome, and we get to see our church family. We get to be together. We get to be warm in the middle of winter together. Uh, we get to have incredible coffee after the service at Milk and Honey. Big shout out to all the baristas in the back there making amazing coffee in all of our locations here in Greenstone and around. But we come to worship Jesus. And that is very specific because uh, we come into a place to take our eyes, our hope, our faith, our expectations, our feelings off of the world, off of ourselves, and place it on Him. Place it on the one who was all powerful, all knowing, almighty, yet chose to come to us to walk among us, to serve us, and to die for us, to redeem us. And so when we come into church, we don't just come for the sake of tradition and community, we actually come with an expectation that in our worship, in His presence, that something would be transferred from Him into us, something would be ignited within us, that we would come to a higher revelation than just what's happening in the world, what's going on around us and how we feel, but actually that our faith would be transitioned from ourselves and our environments or our awareness from ourselves and our environments onto Him and His goodness and His grace. And so whenever we look at Scripture, we should always look at Scripture to fundamentally see Jesus and to look at what the higher truth of that Scripture would be concerning Him. So Psalm 91, although it is written in the Old Testament, it is not written about another God. In fact, uh, in the Old Testament, you'll find Jesus is concealed and revelation allows him to be revealed. But he is always there. He is not a God that was on holiday, right, until God was like, okay, we can't help the earth right now. It's a mess. Let's find Jesus throw him at the problem. No, Jesus was present from the beginning, part of the Godhead that created the universe, part of the Godhead that breathed their spirit into us, part of the Godhead that structured and designed and made all things beautiful. And so he was there in the creation, but he is our redemption. And what differentiates our faith from every other form of religious worship is him and his centrality, and his lordship. He is not a prophet to be considered, nor a good man to be observed. He is the one, the true, the Messiah, the only living God, the only one who conquered sin and death. Great men and women have come and gone, but their remains are still in the ground, and their words cannot heal. Their words cannot transcend time and space. But he is the one who is God personified unto us. And so when we look at Psalm 91, we're looking at a significant prayer that speaks of a prayer of protection. It speaks of a supernatural covering. It speaks of a God who comes down and takes care of his children. And when we look at this, what we can do is we can see that God doesn't need to deny circumstance. He doesn't need to say what enemies. He doesn't need to say what trials or tribulations. No, he recognizes what we face, but they do not overwhelm him. When Jesus was on the earth, yes, there was poverty, there was famine, there was disease. Uh, there was all kinds of natural things going on. But how many of you know when he entered a situation, what was naturally going on was submitted to him? 
supernaturally, right? It had to submit and surrender to him. There was a storm until he spoke to it. Someone was dead until he decided to raise them from the dead. There was sickness until he healed the sickness. And so Jesus being present was not the denial of natural circumstance, nor the denial of what comes against us, but merely recognizing that his presence was far greater. Amen? So, so we, we don't need to look around the world and then feel like we are alone without God. Right? We can look at the world, but no, we face it with God. So with Psalm 91, we read it last week, we'll read it again today, but last week we kind of focused on the conversation that says, I will say of the Lord in verse 2, Psalm 91 verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. And so we spoke about how important it is to speak the word, because you're always speaking words, always. You're speaking words all the time. You're speaking opinions and you're speaking truths and you're speaking feelings and emotions. But how many of you know that you are actually meant to speak the word, especially over circumstances and situations, right? And so how, how many of you know that it was interesting that, that a king doesn't run around working, a king speaks and work gets done. The, the king's words have weight, and it's interesting that when the Russia, when the Russian, <laughs> when the Roman centurion approached Jesus, sorry, apologies about that, okay? Hey, empires just change names and faces, okay? Um, but the interesting thing is when he approached Jesus, he recognized the authority, and he recognized that true authority doesn't have to go. True authority speaks and it is done. And he said, if you would just speak it, they would be made whole. The one whom is sick in my home that I seek healing for. Jesus said, you want me to come and heal? And he said, no, don't come, just speak it. I know that when you say it, it will be done because your words create, your words construct. And so the word of God is not written here for us to ignore but for us to emphasize. I'm tired of people telling me that the word of God and the ways of this world are equal. The world created nothing, it simply corrupts it. The world is still struggling to create life, cannot create life, only pervert it. And so it is for us to recognize we have a higher word, a higher truth. They may say, they may think they're entitled to, but Jesus didn't say, hey, hey, what do they say about me? He said, now what do you say about me, right? And he came to die for you, redeem you. And you have the authority to walk as a believer in Christ in a different level of authority. You are differentiated by him. And he wants you to know his word. So when we look at Psalm 91, this passage of scripture actually has authority and the word of God has authority over the now, over the here, right? And, and so it's interesting to me, like I hear constantly, I'm always on the lookout for little things that little testimonies and Tara sent something to me a few weeks ago that was interesting, but when, um, when, uh, um, when a whole bunch of, of, of Jewish kids were taken hostage uh, in October last year, one girl whose name is Sapir Cohen was provoked uh, in, her, in her being a few months before uh, to learn a passage of scripture from the Old Testament, we would call it. And she learned a passage of scripture and she was fearing, she felt, that she would be sick or she would come under disease or something. So she learned a passage of scripture she had kind of known about through her Judeo faith in, in hearing it spoken by rabbis and she took that and she studied it and she learned it off by heart and she would recite it day by day. And when she was taken hostage and held hostage 
and witnessing other hostages being tortured and tormented, she would say this scripture. And in her own words, now that she has been returned, she was one of the hostages that was returned, or she got back to Israel, she's sharing her story. And as she shares her story, she speaks about this prayer she would pray that she learned. And, and even the one day, she says, one of the soldiers holding her hostage came to her and showed her an image with her, her death, uh, kind of, and a, and a candle. And she was upset, and she said, why would you show me a candle? Are you saying to me, I'm next? And he said, no, even though I hate you, even though I want you dead, you are full of light. And wherever you are, there is light. Now listen to what she was quoting. What was she reading from Scripture? She speaks about it, Psalm 27. Let me read it to you, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumble and fell. But my point being... I'm not interested in your political opinion today. I'm showing you scripture works for all who believe, Jew and Gentile. The reconciled church has different backgrounds, different beliefs in our heritage, our legacies, our earthly backgrounds, whatever your DNA says, where you come from. Yes, that's one thing, but you are now one in Christ, and He is your Lord, and His Word has authority, ultimate authority. The early church were not busy with politics. They were busy with God. And when Jesus came and said, I'm the Messiah, the question was, are you here to conquer the Romans? He said, I'm here to conquer way more than just a natural empire. I'm here to conquer the very thing that stands between you and eternal life. The very, the very enemy. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against people. We fight against a spirit on this world. And that spirit comes to stand against one thing, one vehicle, one purpose. And do you know what that is according to Scripture? Since Christ has come, lived, died, redeemed us, and is raised again from the dead, he commissioned something into being. That very thing is the only thing that stands between the devil and his plans. And it's not a government. And it's not a race. It's not a gender. It is the church. It's the only thing the devil is busy trying to destroy. It is the only thing evil has come against because it is the very testimony of the living God. It is the very testimony. Something that is so beautiful about the early church, people don't even recognize, is the early church was not born only of Jew. It began with the precious believers that were Jewish. But then God did something no one could ever have thought and used Peter, a Jew, to go and tell the gospel to a Roman soldier and his family in their house. And the moment he shared those words in Acts chapter 10, Christ died for their sin. They believed and they were filled with the Spirit. And the church was born into something no one could have believed. Two eternal enemies unified by one Savior, by one Messiah, by one God. Could you imagine the early church services? What language do we sing in? <laughs> Are we gonna sing those songs or these songs? Or are you of this tribe or those people? Are you circumcised or not circumcised? The early church was not a gathering of like-minded, natural people. People groups that had hated each other for years, generations. People groups that had tormented and enslaved one another for generations came to serve one another. 
pray for one another, and in turn, use the power that God gave them not to destroy enemies, not to curse, but to bless. Pray for those who curse you. Bless those who hate you and use you. They were not an army with weapons of warfare like swords and spears, but yet it was the fastest growing movement. It shook Every empire, it has outlasted every single ideology. Why? Because it is not powered by our beliefs, our energy, our authority. It is powered by the spirit of the living God. Right? And let me just say this. Yes, we can recognize what's going on in the world. But let me just say, let us not ignore the power of God that sits within, that sits within in this word, that you can walk into an atmosphere and bring the power of God. You know what the power of God looks like when someone who has established themselves on such a strong hill because of their pain, because of their past, because of their suffering, that you come in and speak words of love, grace, and life. That you come in and say, hey, hey, I'm not here to start a fight with you. I'm here just to love and serve you. What, what kind of person are you? Hey, I'm just someone who Jesus has changed. Right? And I, I, I'm not, I will get to the conversations going on in the world today. Let me, let me go there now before we get to this. Because I want to show you a video that blessed me. I, have a, I, I know someone who runs a a movement across Europe that does missions work and does street evangelism and, and goes into the streets and prays for people and just leading something called Awakening Europe. And while there was blatant, open blasphemy and mockery on screens around the world, mocking Jesus, our faith, and the Holy Communion. Whilst that was happening inside a stadium, this is what was happening in the streets of Paris. Tellement gentil, Père, et tu as mis tellement de bonnes choses en lui, Seigneur Jésus-Christ, et je veux juste te remercier pour ça, Thank Seigneur. Et, et Seigneur, je ne sais pas ce qu'il a vécu dans sa vie, Seigneur, c'est toi qui sais toutes choses, mais les choses, Seigneur, qu'il a voulu peut-être mettre, euh, Seigneur, euh, dans son mm. cœur et vouloir, Seigneur, combler un vide nouveau avec toi, Père. Et je te remercie parce que, Seigneur, quand une âme est sauvée, bah, toi, tu es heureux, Seigneur Jésus-Christ, et il va pouvoir impacter. That. That the devil can't stop. Yes, we must be strong in our faith. Yes, we must be outspoken and say, it's not okay to mock what we believe. But that's not going to stop them. What is the difference between us and every other religion? The gospel of Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to me, believer. Speak up saying things are evil, but don't stop there. Speak up telling people who they are in Christ. Speak up telling people that the grace of God has come, that they would live a life and an identity they could never find, a value that they've always sought out. There is a life for a person in Christ that they could never earn, never know, never. Let me tell you something. There is something greater than pride called the humility of knowing Jesus. There is something greater than saying. You see, all other religions will say, I am here to make sure you never come against me and my God and my belief system. And if you do, I will wage war on you. Well, let me tell you, we don't wage war in the natural flesh, but we come with spiritual weapons, the ministry of Jesus, the grace of God that says, let me sit with you and tell you how valuable and precious you really are, that the Son of God would come down, live and die for you. Of course, we have issue statements and we say things and we are against the open mockery. But let me just tell you something. The devil mocks what he is afraid of. 
The reason it is being mocked is not because we are not a violent religion. The reason it is being mocked is because our God is alive, active and moving. And whilst the stage can say something, the streets have a very different story to tell. And I noticed that in that opening ceremony, in that mockery and whatever was going on, there was a child in the middle of that ceremony sitting there, and the devil's very open that he's after the next generation. But let me tell you something, the church is after the next generation. And what I notice in Scripture is every time God has done something amazing, every time a, a precious child with a purpose is born, in response to a prophetic declaration over a child in Scripture, a prophetic declaration over a moment in Scripture, even the coming of Christ, after it has been pronounced God has done something, then the devil responds. Then he brings Herod into action to try and kill every child. Too late, Jesus has already been hidden in Bethlehem. Don't stress, then he gets brought in. Now, here's where I'm coming, right? Here's where I'm coming. What happened in Paris doesn't tell me the devil's ahead. It tells me he is behind, and God has born a generation that is alive on this earth right now. Your children and your grandchildren are going to testify like no generation before. They are going to move in signs and wonders like no generation before. And as the world gets darker and thick darkness covers the people, the church will shine bright, right? The gospel is the difference, not judgment and not morality. The gospel is the difference. Of course we believe in morality. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But the difference is holiness through faith in Christ Jesus. Righteousness through faith in Christ Jesus. Godliness through faith in Christ Jesus. Not a work that we should boast of ourselves. That's the difference. So when we look at Scripture, we are not looking at a list of requirements. We are looking at a story of our God, right? The story of our Savior. And when we look at Scripture, let me just say this. Is it not amazing how, how we can take a Scripture from hundreds, if not thousands of years ago and speak it over a moment and it has authority? Psalm 91, there's a famous, famous, famous historical account during the World War where the soldiers were stuck, the British soldiers were stuck at the Battle of Dunkirk, and they were stuck on a beach, and the soldiers uh, were firing thousands of rounds at them on the beach. And this is not something told in Sunday school. This is not a story told just for Christians. This is a historical account. How do you know it's a historical account? Because of the hundreds of eyewitnesses. And what had happened was the soldiers had memorized Psalm 91. And at the Battle of Dunkirk, it was not a battle because what it was, was in essence, soldiers being brought to a beach and they were in uh, they were on the beach, but the enemy had the high ground, and they showered thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, right, of bullets on them. And then through a series of absolutely inexplicable events, the weather changes and hinders aircraft from bombing it. These things all happen, and there is no explanation given, but the soldiers on the beach who were showered with thousands of rounds of bullets made it out. And one thing was being screamed at the top of their lungs for hours. It was not blasphemy, not swear words, not even help me tell my mom. Psalm 91 was getting recited, recited, recited. Go Google it. It, it. it was something no one could understand. Why? Because the Word of God has authority which is why the devil wants you not to speak it over your lives. So Psalm 91, you know, it's funny, is let's read Psalm 91 verses one together. This is what I wanted to focus on today. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Right? That's the key to Psalm 91, is to be in the secret place. Isn't it interesting to me that if you are in trouble, we all know this now because a TV show was made famous called Rescue 911, where if you were in trouble in the US, you would phone 911. That was the number you called when you needed protection, help, health, healing, right? Psalm 91.1 says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, I have good news for you. It is not a secret place, meaning it is not a secret to us. The language there is a place that is hidden. It does not mean a place hidden from you. It means a place enemies and attack and evil have no access to. But what's interesting is in Scripture, nothing in Scripture is there by chance, by mistake. You know, we must be, we are so foolish when we read Scripture and we think we need to add our insight to the Word of God. We have to be so careful. In fact, we should never change the Word of God to suit our feelings, our emotions, our cultural relevance. It's His Word, not yours. You can write all the words of your own and all your opinions in books and paper, and they will be gone tomorrow. <laughs> when you leave this earth, your words, they aren't going to change people's lives. They're not going to do anything. In fact, the man who actually felt that the Bible was the most irrelevant thing, Voltaire, and declared it from the streets and actually said literally from his house that Christianity, Christianity will be wiped from the earth within the coming decades. The very house in which he lived and the place in which he made that statement today is a Bible printing press, right? People will come and people will go. Empires will come and empires will go, but the word of God will remain, right? And so I wanna dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Now what's fascinating about this passage of scripture is it describes God with two separate names. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, Elion, right, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty God, El Shaddai. So you have Elion and El Shaddai. Most High God, right, Most Mighty God. Now, if you look at the principle of first mention, which means wherever something is said for the first time in Scripture, it is significant, right? First, it's beautiful. And like I said, the Bible is so holy and perfect that the more you open up nuggets and you look at letters and you look at meanings and you look at places and you start to actually unpack, it blows your mind. I love the English language not more than I love Hebrew because Hebrew has so much more than English language. Hebrew has not just got letters, letters have numbers. Letters actually have pictures. And so when we look at it, you will see that God, when he wrote scripture in Hebrew, chose that language for a purpose. In fact, the most holy name of God, Yahweh, Yute Vav He, is made up of the letters yud hey, vav hey. A Jew will never ever say Yahweh, it is the most holy name of God. You're not even meant to utter it, right? They would never say it because it is the most holy name of God. But yud hey, vav hey, is the Hebrew letters yud hey, vav hey, Yahweh. And when Jesus hung on the cross, because of the language of the day being Latin, he was being crucified for being called the king of the Jews. Jesus, king of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And the way the Latin was written had to be transcribed into the Hebrew. And when the Hebrew was transcribed from the Latin, an acrostics appeared on the cross, which is why the high priests ran to Pilate saying, take the sign down. Because on the sign, it said, here lies Jesus, king of the Jews, but in Hebrew was Yut, Hey, 
Vav, Hey. Here is Yahweh. Beyond that, Yut, Hey, Vav, Hey. Yut is hand. Vav, I mean, Yut, Hey is the word grace. Vav is nail. Hey is grace. The hand of grace nailed in grace. Hanging on the cross. Yahweh. See what I mean? It's awesome. I mean, the first question asked in Scripture, God says when Adam sins in the garden, where are you? When man sins, what is the question? Where are you? What's interesting is people ask that question, churches ask that question, religious leaders ask that question, your conscience asks you that question. In fact, I would argue the devil, if he's wise, would argue that, ask you that question because what it does is it locates you in your sin. Very first question asked in Scripture, Adam and Eve, you're hiding, why? Where are you? Well, what is the first question in the New Testament? Where is he born the king of the Jews. When you were born a sinner, yeah, the question was, where are you? I'm a sinner. <clears throat> but when Jesus came to the earth, the first question in scripture in the Old Testament is answered by the first question in the New Testament. God doesn't want you focused on where are you. He wants you shifting to a new covenant that says, where is he? Because if you can locate him, place your faith in him, as he is, so will you be in this world, right? And when the world says, what about you? You say, no, but what about him? Well, what have you done? Well, what has he done? Where do you come from? Where has he come from? The answer is always the first with the first. You see what I'm saying? So the first time these two names for God are mentioned is by design. So where we look, where does God get called most high? The very first time in scripture. My goodness, you'll also find that around that moment, he is also called the Almighty for the very first time. And what is even more fascinating is, since God is perfect and his word is himself, you will find that the first time he is called most high is chronologically the first time he is mentioned of these two names. And the second time the name is mentioned is what the shadow of the Al Shaddai Almighty. Could it be that maybe God wants us to go and find where these two names are mentioned to possibly get greater revelation of what is the secret place? Yes, of course. So let's go there together. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram saying, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from you, nothing like a thread to a sandal strap, nothing that is yours, lest it should, you should say, I made Abram rich. The first time in Scripture El Elyon is mentioned, God Most High, is when Melchizedek is pronouncing the blessing on Abraham. What is happening around this moment? Well, we know that Melchizedek 
is not a normal person. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus, our high priest, he does not come out of the lineage of the Levitical priesthood, meaning the earthly manly priesthood. The earthly manly priesthood that would lead the temple, that would have the bloodline for the high priests, that came out of Abram, right? And out of Abram's bosom, out of Abram's seed came the Levitical priesthood. But Melchizedek comes and the Bible gives us no, we have no information about Melchizedek's birth nor his death. He is an appearance of a priesthood and he is appointed a priesthood not by man but by God. Right? And in Hebrews it tells us that Jesus and Melchizedek come from the same priesthood, meaning the same office, the same authority. I personally believe it was the appearance of Christ, but the language could not be given to it. But whether you like it or not, it's definitely Jesus's office. It tells us he is a priest of God most high. Now, when the most high God comes down to Abraham, what is he bringing with him? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. The body and the blood. It is the ministry of Jesus that he brings health, wholeness, and redemption. He, his ministry, is not one of condemnation, but of blessing and salvation. And he appears and what's so interesting is it says, literally, Melchizedek, king of Salem, right? Melchizedek and the name Salem is righteousness and peace, right? So here he comes, and he brings bread and wine. And when he gives Abram the bread and the wine, when that has been received, what comes from him in verse 20? He blesses him, verse 19. Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. After he says this, Abram responds with a tithe. The tithe is not a Ten Commandments instruction. It is a response before the law was given to the goodness and the grace of God. It is a response. Say this again. Tithing is not for everyone. <laughs> Tithing is for those who believe Jesus is the one who gives them everything, who blessed them, who paid the price. It is a response, not a requirement. It is not something done in fear. It is something done in worship. And Abram responds, who else is there when communion is shared? Sodom shows up. Sodom. The king of Sodom. Sodom was the center of sexual perversion, evil worship, paganism. Comes to make a scene, to get attention, to say, Look at me, look at me, look at me. This is not about you, Abram, and Melchizedek. This is about me and you, Abram. Us, we need to talk. And Sodom says, you give me the people. I'll give you all the riches. You know, Jesus said, you can't worship me and mammon at the same time. Mammon was the God of all substance being worshiped at the time. People would even sacrifice their children to the God of Mammon to engage in purchasing provision for their families and great wealth at the time of Christ. And what's fascinating is Sodom comes to say, worship me. But he's not after Abram's money, he's after the people that Abram delivered from Sodom. It's fascinating to me this whole Paris thing they didn't mock everything in Christianity. They mocked one moment. There was Sodom on display. 
Now I wanna say something to you, church. Did Abraham get involved in an argument over doctrine with Sodom? No. He said, it's not about you. I've raised my hand in worship. Let's not get sidetracked by what's going on and stop our worship. Let's, let's not give all our speech to what the world is saying and the attention the world is looking for without giving our speech to the gospel, the good news, the scripture, the promises, and the blessing of God. If you are known in your workplace as a Christian, be known as the person who speaks life over people, who encourages people, who says you are valuable and precious. Of course, what is sin is sin. The world knows what sin is sin. That's why it's even mocking it. It's like, hey, we're sinners. Good luck with that. But let me tell you something. Be known for being the person that comes into the room and is able to carry the love, the grace, the goodness of God, and the Holy Spirit's wisdom will allow you to see people in their brokenness, in their searching, in their hopelessness, and in those moments speak words of life. And I promise you this, that has more effect than arguing right and wrong till we're blue in the face, right? Because people are looking for two things in this world, value, acceptance, and identity. And both can only be found in Christ Jesus. What is fascinating to me is when the devil gives you evil thoughts, he uses personal pronouns. He does not say, you are a failure. He does not say, you have a sexual brokenness. He does not say, you have no value. He speaks, I am broken. I have no value. I am a sexual deviant. I have no purpose. And you hear those words and you believe them. For if he says you, you know it's someone else speaking. <laughs> Which is why scripture tells you to declare, not Jesus is righteous, I am righteous in Christ Jesus. The church will, will everyone will say amen, amen, amen when we say if you are sick, you must say I am healed. If you are poor, you must say in Christ, I am rich, but if you sin, confess your sin. No, in fact, confession of sin is homologio. Speak the word of God, the same word of God over that. You are to confess when you sin, even though I just sinned. I am righteous in Christ. You see how weird it gets? Because why? That's where spiritual warfare for if you would receive the identity God gives you in Christ, you would live like that identity. You would live according to the promise, live according to the plan he has for you. And it's so easy for us to personify brokenness. I am depressed, I am a failure, I am suicidal. But the devil comes with these suggestions. You, no, not you, I right, I, I, I. Often say to people, when did you become depressed? I'm not coming against it. I wanna know where it began. How did you get there? So often there is a moment or there is a word someone speaks over someone, an identity given to you. You're a failure, you're no good, you're of no value. Those words are believed and received. Let me tell you something. The devil has no creative power. He recognizes how God works. And how does God work? He speaks a word over your life. And you believe it and you receive it and then you become it. He just takes God's ways and he perverts them. <laughs> so he comes with the same thing. Let me just say this to you. That is why we need to hear the word of God more than we hear anything else. Right? That is why we need to believe the word of God more than we believe everything else. And that is why we have to be very careful to believe our feelings if our feelings are rooted in something that we thought we think. Because let me say this, your mind thinks thoughts that are not the same as the thoughts God thinks about you. Your mind needs renewing. What is renewing of the mind? I won't sin, I won't sin, I won't sin. No, I'm righteous in Christ Jesus. I am precious. He gave me a purpose. He gave me a life on this earth. He came. He died. He sees in me what I could never see in myself, right? How good is my God? Yes, I might not be perfect, and he knew it. That is why he came in his perfection, right? 
So we take the word of God and we apply it and we give it a personal pronoun. I, me, my savior, my righteousness. So Abram says to Sodom, it's not about you, bud. It's about Melchizedek. It's about me worshiping him. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 15, verses one, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. After these things, a word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. That word there for shield is I am your hedge, I am your supernatural offensive weapon, a 360 degree encompassing shield. It is, it, today, when you, when you look at the, the, the flag of Israel, there is a star on there that is called the Star of David. Nowhere in the Old Testament is there a thing called the Star of David. Why is it on the flag of Israel? Because under David as a nation, they conquered the most. So for them, it is a symbol of their authority, their militant authority, their power, and how that they are protected. That's what they put that on their flag for. But hear me out, there is no such thing as the star of David in Scripture. There's only one star. For the word star in Hebrew is the word magen, which also means shield. The first mention of the word magen around warfare is not the magen of David. It's the magen of Avram. When your enemies attack you one way, they will flee seven ways, right? So look at this. After these things, God says, I am your shield. What things? After these things, the moment you receive the bread and the wine, your health, your protection, and your healing is no longer your burden to carry. God says to Abram, after you have received of Melchizedek's ministry, partaking of communion, I am now your shield. I am the one who will protect you from every enemy. But then it also says your exceedingly great reward. The Hebrew there for reward is not once off bonus lottery. Exceedingly great monthly salary. That's the literal Hebrew writing. After these things, I am your shield. What are you my shield from? Sickness, death, destruction. And what else happened? He responded with a tithe. And God says, now I will be your exceedingly great monthly salary. <laughs> right? Secret place living is not about, have you seen pasta now? If you oxygenate your water, have you seen pasta now? If you don't eat protein, do eat protein. Only eat protein, only eat fat, only eat raw mood, uh, food, only eat steamed food, you'll have health. Pastor, have you seen that? If you sleep this, if you have magnesium, yes, yes, all those things are great, but health cannot be purchased. Well, actually, that's not scripturally correct. It can be purchased and was purchased by the body of our Lord and Savior, right? And was purchased for you. And the second thing about the secret place is your provision is his responsibility. When we tithe, we are saying, my financial needs is your responsibility. You will provide for me. You are my significant Lord, my incredible God most high. So what's amazing is it says God most high is mentioned around that moment. God most high is mentioned around that moment. Why most high God? Can I tell you something? Because humility recognizes the authority of God, right? Humility says I can't strive for my health. I can't work for my righteousness. 
I can't earn the grace of God, and I certainly can't earn the financial security in my own ability that you want to give me. But I recognize, yes, Melchizedek, peace, grace, and righteousness comes. But I recognize that blessing in Jesus actually releases the power of God most high. Higher than any recession, higher than every disease, higher. Bible says it another way, it says, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is the name above every other name. When you receive communion, that is the ministry of Jesus. We receive communion regularly as a church. You can do it daily. But when you receive of communion, when you respond, this is the first church service in Scripture. Jesus is released, and the congregant responds with their tithe. You know, it's so, it is so mocked by the world. You would have communion. You would give of your money. Are you crazy? Why is it so mocked? It is the secret place. It is the secret place. The devil knows when you position yourself here, he cannot touch you. He wants to get a hold of you, which is why he's like, ah, it's only about money. Well, it is. It's only about our provision. And by our, I don't mean the budget of the church. I mean us, the believer in Jesus, right? It is only about our healing and our wholeness. It is about us walking in a way. And here's the thing. When you walk in this way in this secret place, do you know what your coworkers say? What's your secret? What's your secret? Are you trading Forex late at night? Are you hustling? Are you working the angles? Huh, no, I'm not. But my Lord and Savior is. He's the one working. He's the one providing. In fact, the Bible actually says, our tithe will testify that he, Jesus, lives in the book of Hebrews. How does it testify he lives? Only a living God can provide. Only a living God can provide today, here, and now. The secret place. I don't have time to get to the other name. We'll do that next time. The secret place. The secret place. The secret place. The secret place has nothing to do with your ability. And it has nothing to do with the significance of your enemies. It has everything to do with who do you worship? Who do you worship? And I don't mean worship like, Pastor, I'm working for God. I mean worship in the true form of worship, which is who do you look to in a time of need? Who do you go to first? Whose effort do you trust most? Whose strength do you rely on? Worship means I'm nothing, but He's everything. Worship means, yes, 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 that's happening in the world, that's happening in the economy, that's happening around us, that's happening to my body, that's happening around my home. No, 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 but I don't look at these things in this fallen world. No, I place my faith and my hope and my trust in Jesus. That's who I worship. And that's the secret place. I want to encourage you. Whenever you're feeling stressed, whenever you're feeling panicked, whenever the world comes with, whenever Sodom shows up with all his issues and his stuff, whenever the world comes and your feelings and your emotions, whatever it is comes to steal your peace, it is trying to get you to leave the secret place where your faith is in Jesus. The secret place where your hope is in Jesus. The secret place where you are, cons you are just focusing on his ministry unto you. His ministry. I love that the Bible says this of communion. Do this as often as is necessary. You can do this many times in a day. Pastor, why do we eat bread and drink wine? What is the easiest thing for a human being to do besides breathe? Eat. And how did everything go wrong in the beginning? Through eating. How does everything go right in the end? Through eating. It is the redeeming power of our Lord in our lives.
the secret place, the secret place, the place where the devil cannot put his hands on you, the place where the devil cannot control you. Father, I thank you that in this place today, people would surrender their lives to your secret place. Come back to your secret place. Dwell in the secret place under the shadow of your almighty power. I thank you, Father, that we'll live this life, the Psalm 91 life, supernaturally with you in the coming days and weeks. I pray for I pray for divine health and wholeness in every home. I pray for supernatural, supernatural intervention. Father, that people will read this passage, quote this passage with their faith in Jesus. Father, I thank you that we're not hopeless, we're not helpless. We have you to conquer every attack of every enemy in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We'll continue this in the coming weeks. I want to hand redemption back to the pastors there. Those of you here in Rhema right now, I want to ask you to stand. Amen. What a great word this morning. Come on, let's give God a hand for his word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to ask that you just bow your head in this place. Father, thank you for your secret place where your protection is dispensed to us, where your power is dispensed to us, that the devil cannot get to us. We were born to live under the shadow of the Almighty. Father, we place ourselves under the shadow of your wings again. If we've moved out of that place right now, we place ourselves back under your protection, back under your salvation that declares we are righteous in Christ Jesus, just like we've heard this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the secret place. Thank you, Jesus for the authority that we carry in Christ Jesus. If we only knew the power and the authority that we have been given in Christ, healing is our portion, protection is our portion, deliverance is our portion because of the finished work of our beautiful Lord and Savior Jesus. We magnify the name of Jesus right now. We lift high the name of Jesus right now in this room, in our lives. We give no place to the devil in the mighty name of Jesus. And I want to give an opportunity to those that are sitting here this morning that you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're sitting here and you've been feeling the tug of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Don't listen to your head. Listen to your heart today. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Don't walk out these doors and miss the opportunity for Jesus to come and allow you to experience His secret place in your life. I want to ask you right now, if that is you, won't you just quickly slip up your hand? Be brave, be bold this morning. If that is you in this place, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We are family. Say yes to Jesus. You're not saying yes to a man. You're saying yes to the Lord. He is drawing you unto himself. You were made for him. He is your creator. Come back. Come back today. If that is you, just quickly slip up your hands so that we can pray with you and for you. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, family. We're just going to pray together. If that is you, I want you to just repeat this very simple prayer after me. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. I ask you now to forgive my sins and come and wash me white as snow. Today I declare that I am a child of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give them a hand all across this room. All of heaven rejoices at one that comes into the kingdom. Amen. 
If that is you, if you said that prayer for the very first time, we've got a new believers table at the back. Won't you come and just visit us? We want to give you some resource just to help you on your journey. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of God. Are you good? Everyone good? How good was the message today? Don't you love Pastor Josh? We love our pastors. Thank you, Lord, for our pastors, for his obedience, that we can be blessed with the word this morning. So now we're going to take communion together. Who doesn't have a little cup and a wafer? As you walked in this morning, you should have received one of these. If you don't have, please raise your hand high and we'll make sure that we get one to you. Just keep your hand up. There's a few in the front. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word that is going to take root in our hearts right now. And as we just also partake of communion, thank you that you seal your word in our hearts, God. Our heavenly Melchizedek, thank you, Jesus. You can stand, you can be seated, whatever is comfortable for you. I think everyone has. You can peel back the first layer to the little wafer that represents the body of our Lord and Savior that was broken, that was crushed, that was scarred, that was scourged beyond recognition. Come on, let's lift our eyes and put them on Jesus right now. Just see Jesus. See Jesus right now. Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken, for our wholeness and our healing. In Christ Jesus, we are perfectly whole. Thank you, God, that as we eat, we eat life, divine life and health to our bodies right now in Jesus' name. And you can peel back the second layer that gets you to the blood, the juice that represents the blood that flowed from Jesus on the cross. More than enough, an overpayment. Overpayment, more than enough that washes us and cleanses us from every sin past. Your past is erased, present and future. That's the power of the blood of Jesus that speaks over us today and declares us righteous, a righteous child of God, that as we partake today, we drink health and life into our bodies. Partake. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we trust that you were blessed. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our page and maybe share this word with someone else. Or even better, join us in person at one of our churches yes. one day. Until then, be blessed. Yes.